it's that time again. It's the Berkey and the Badger Board Game Babble Show. It's going to get wild. It's going to get wacky. It might even get a little zany. We're going to talk about board games and the board game industry. And, you know, we might talk about anything else we want to talk about. Um, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, would you please rise for your right honorable king, uh, King Barkey. It's Berkey and Badger, and we're trying out something really cool. It's a program called Steam Yard, baby. So we're going to see if the kingdom of Babylon works with this new magical thingy that we're trying. Pokery pokery. Oh, Mm. hocus pocus. (laughs) Yes, hocus pocus. Well, Babylites, welcome to the Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble, episode 70, and our wonderful kingdom of Babylon. I am your honorable king, Berkey, and I'm the host of this elegant podcast that is streamed live on YouTube through Steam Yard. <laughs> yes. Well, from your humble king, right down to the lowest of the low keyboard lickers. Yeah, that's me. Keyboard lickers. Say that three times fast and you win a prize. Oh, well, speaking of keyboard lickers, here is my co-host and court jester, the the, 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 the Badger. (laughs) Hello, chaps and chapets and Babalites. That's the one, Babalites. I'm on the wrong show here. Babalites. Babalites. There is no, no, the Babalites. This is episode 70. Google Hangout (laughs) is dead. Long live whatever. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank. What's up with that anyway? I I don't know. I think they're just blowing too much money elsewhere. Google have been doing some weird stuff, haven't they? Yeah, you know, Google was cool. I mean, I liked the Hangout, but then they threw away the toolbox, and so then that was no fun, but... You know, Steamyard, this thing looks like it might be pretty cool. And we got even little namies right below us. There's names in the corner. Yeah, so people can tell which one of us is Berkey and which one of us is Badger. Yeah. It's, and we it's can also do this and see who's in the in the castle with us. We have Kabuki Kid. Kabuki Kid's in who, the house. Who says... In the castle. Berkey needs to center himself. Center. <laughs> center. I've been centered a long time. Yeah, and Ben Luncheon says, wow, it looks great. Yes, it does look great. Our heads are level. Yeah, our heads are level, but I can zoom out like that as well. You're missing out on this on the podcast. I prefer having a big head. Yeah. You have a, I have a big head, you have a fat head. (laughs) It's the head. Hey, do you know, you know how to lose 30 pounds of ugly fat? Uh, Throw him a bone. Cut off your head. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I have to get some drops put in. A little touch of a button and it's like... So. That, that was a, that's a joke when you have a lot of children. Yes. Hello, Darth. Darth Gar- Grada. <laughs> yes, the duck icon in the top. Don't worry about it. It's because we're using the free version. Darth Grader. Yeah. It's Darth Grader. Okay. I am your father uh, is in the house. See, this is another good thing about this. Um, if I do muck up someone's name, there's evidence on the screen what it really is and what they're saying. <laughs> so anyway, hello everyone. Welcome to episode 70. We're going to do a quick roundup of what's been happening here in ba 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 lot um, And then we're going to go into our, our roundup of rumours and things that make us go, hmm. And we're going to do... Um, something we haven't done for a very long time, which is our good, bad, and ugly section, where we talk about first impressions of games that we've played. And we've played lots over the past three, four months, because that's probably the last time that we did it. You've played lots. And then that, we're going to go for a lovely little stroll through the woods of Evergreen and talk about our three favourite games from the year 2009. The games which are still evergreens and still... Hold a place. Still hold up. Not necessarily our favorite. There's because we're going to revisit this every so often as we loop through the well, the woods, they're my right? Favorite. They're your favorite. So you're picking your top three. Yeah, my top three. From I'm not picking my top three. But they are evergreens. At the same time, they are evergreens. Yes. Um, and then um, we're going to babble about unboxing, but probably not what yeah. you think. 
So without further ado, what's been going on in your end of Babalot, my my sire? Wow. Well, Babalot, uh, it's got to be the biggest show in the northern western part of Babalot is Gen Con. Gen Con. Gen Con. <laughs> yeah, what else can you say? I mean, when you think about going to Gen Con, particularly as a vendor and having to set up, that's how you say it. Con! But like that. Gen Con! But as, a, as an attendee that are going to have fun, you go, Gen Con. Ooh. <laughs> you're so happy because you're going to Gen Con and you don't have to do anything but look at all the pretty things. But setting up all the pretty things... Uh, that's another story. But no, seriously, uh, Gen Con this year was really great. Um, it, it, it's a horrible thing to run a Kickstarter and then have the Kickstarter end and have one week to get all of your stuff together to go to the biggest show in North America. Um, but it was it was actually awesome. We arrived early on Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., and we were able to set up a bunch of game toppers for Cool Mini or Not and uh, Simon, come on, and for AEG. And i got to tell you, AEG did something so cool this year. Every day they had a different theme in their booth. Now, they had 12 of, the, of our Adler game toppers that they purchased, and i got to say... Uh, I just think they knocked it out of the park. You know, the first day they had Edge of Darkness demonstrating on all the game toppers. All the backdrops were Edge of Darkness themed. The next day it was Tiny Towns. The next day it was kind of a, 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 a hodgepodge of different games like War Chest. And they had Tiny Towns, Edge of Darkness and, and Space Base. All kinds of different games out there. But then... On the last day, they had Echoes, their brand new game, and it just looked like a million bucks in those booths. If you go to GameToppersLLC.com uh, or GameToppersLLC Facebook page, you'll see some of these gorgeous pictures. So uh, there was so many awesome things that were happening at Gen Con. Uh, uh, Simon uh, was doing the new Trevang Kickstarter, was showing it, and their new Tableau digital table which was crazy awesome uh we had some amazing discussions with uh come on as well and uh, we're going to be doing some really cool things with game toppers with come on in the future and at Essen germany but um gen con is such a such a busy time a couple of things i just wanted to share real quick about were some highlights for me first off the highlights are always meeting all of our backers and we partnered with Miniature Market, and we had in booth 2901, and Gray Fox Games was right there, Mythic Games was right next to us, Meeple Source, and they all had toppers, so it looked like this little game topper kingdom over in the corner, okay? So it was pretty neat. Well, long and short of all that, uh, Gen Con was, there was, I, I was saying that we were next to Gray Fox Games, and Mythic Games and Meeple Source. So this whole corner of Gen Con was just like Game Topper Central. And then you went to the other end of the hall and and come on and AEG and Capstone Games and Ar Academy Games and Arcane Wonders and Tasty Minstrel Games. It was like we were Game Toppers everywhere over there. So it was super cool. Um, one of the things that was really neat uh, at the convention, I'll just highlight a little bit, is we went, uh, it's always a big treat for me to meet my backers. So we got tons of pictures with, with backers coming to the booth, and we were partnering with Miniature Market in booth 2901. Just had a great time talking to people, meeting people. I was in back-to-back -back meetings, so it was very busy. But one of the things that uh, was really cool on Saturday night, we went to the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast Meetup at the Alexander Hotel. And I, I stopped over there. I had a dinner meeting beforehand. I just stopped over for a little bit. And then we were going to have another meeting with another publisher after the fact. So I stopped over for about a half an hour. And we're getting ready to leave. And Travis Reynolds from Queen Games, he stops at me and he says, Berkey, come on, you got to get over here. And I said, no, I got to go. 
He goes, no, no, get over here. So I walked over there. Well, here standing in the corner are three designers. It was Jason Matthews who did Twilight Struggle. You had Isaac Childress, who I already know fairly well. And then Stefan Feld was standing there in all of his tallness and gloriness. Uh, well, Jason Matthews, he goes, Berkey, I've been following your Kickstarter. I really want to get one of these. And then Stefan Feld starts talking about the topper, and Jurek was there from from uh, Queen Games as well. He speaks German, and so he was translating, and Stefan was like, oh, I want to get the topper. <laughs> he was, I want the topper. <laughs> So that was really quite, 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 uh, uh, quite a lot of fun meeting Stefan Feld and Jason Matthews, great designers. So that was some real highlights of Gen Con and just seeing so many people enjoying game toppers everywhere you went. And they would come and just say, man, you really upgraded our gaming experience and uh, very, very rewarding and really thrilled to help out all those all those folks. Missed you there. Yeah, it was rather well, sad. I was like looking at all the pictures going, I was there last year. I was there touching those toppers last year. I was there doing, yeah, with these people and friends. But hey-ho, it is what it is. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Well, it's, well, you know, when you talk about Gen Con, you could, you could just talk for hours because there's such wonderful food. There's wonderful oh, no. experiences no. that you have. Food. And, no. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We went back to Harry and Izzy's and had some of that amazing shrimp cocktail with the horseradish, baby. And then Brian Pope from Arcane Wonders buys me a two pound lobster <gasps> with crab meat in it. I ate a two-pound lobster with Tom Vassell and Brian Pope. Okay, but it was a lobster with crab in it. I mean, that's like that's, that's yeah, it was that's all... like ordering pig with with horse in it. <laughs> well, it was like a turducken for lobster. It yeah. was a lobster ducken. Okay, I, I I wanted crab wrapped in lobster and shrimp and wrapped in more crab mm-hmm. and more lobster and rolled all together and and then it had this awesome cheese on it. Ah. And he brought out like three plates of oysters for all of us. Wow. And it was like a bunch of the Arcane Wonder staff was there and some of the Dice Tower crew. And oh my goodness, it was it was crazy off the hook. And then we went to Rathskeller's, which is this German restaurant. Um, oh, you want to talk about some good German sausage and different meals. I had schnitzel the one day and then went with the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast and had bratwurst. But they've got this mustard that you dip your pretzel in, I mean, it'll hit your nose three times. I mean, it's it's way more than that horseradish. <laughs> Boom. Oh, pretzel in your nose. Mm. <laughs> it was awesome. Okay. So, so many great places. Cool. Right, things that make me go with. Oh, I gotta say, oh, one, oh. I gotta say one more oh. thing. I'm so sorry. I, you know, there's so much going on in my head. Um, and, and everywhere else that's going on. <laughs> Uh, we had a backer from Game Toppers. His name is Daniel Sertavis, I believe is how his last name. And uh, he reached out to us the first day that we were there, uh, just before we were driving, and asked if he could take us out to dinner. And so Kelly Hughes, uh, which he's a professor at a college in Alexandria that helps us in the summer months, and he helps a local game store with Kent uh, up in Alexandria. They, the, and then my son Josiah was with as well. All three of us went to this Italian restaurant. I think it was called D'Angelo's or something. And they had this deep dish pizza. And they put like two pounds of mozzarella cheese in the middle of it. So when you open that, that it was like, you know, there's big honking strings of cheese. It was like flipping awesome. But here, one of our backers wanted to spend some time with us and take us out to eat and I was like no you don't have to do that and he's like no I really would like to get to get to meet you guys and I mean what a treat right that is a treat are you talking about food when I haven't eaten you've probably not eaten either no and it's lunchtime and I haven't eaten <laughs> yes, yet dinner end of day dinner time here oh well I'll hold off my <laughs> cheese on toast until uh I do have a diet coke though okay so the things that made me go hum from well, basically, from Gen Con. One, there was the mention of Marvel Splendor. 
that made me go, hmm, because... Oh, so we're, we're moving from what's been happening in Babylon... Oh, right. To yeah, sorry. ...things that are... Is that what you want to do? You want to move uh, on, or do you want to say what you're up to? Oh, yeah. We have to cut all that out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'd leave it in. That's good I'm stuff. I'm so happy playing with all these toys. <laughs> That shows how how how, how unprofessional we, we are. We are very unprofessional. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah. I. Uh, what's been happening here? Um, Salt March RPG. Well, I shouldn't have put that. Really, I should have really put Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, my first oh. Dungeons and Dragons Sirenscape has been released at Gen Con. Um, oh. Yeah. Which is the uh, Lost Minds of Found Dalva, which is the oh, I haven't. Told you. It's the starter set for Dungeons and Dragons. So if you're new to Dungeons and Dragons, it's like twenty bucks. I keep they keep saying, uh, and you pick it up and and delve into the the realms of Dungeons and Dragons. But uh, yeah, I've created the sound set for it, so you can enhance the game by having the actual sounds of Cragmore Cave, and then you got the village of Fandal Fandal Fandal. It's not Fandalver, but it's like that. Uh, Fandalville. Mini Fandelva, uh, Smallville, Fandelvia, I think, Ortonville. Yeah, but you can wander around the village, and there's ruffians there, and they will <laughs> kick in. And then I've added my own music, so I've created my own kind of like Lord of the Rings inspired Fellowship of the Rings kind of music, which plays in the background as like the heroes are strolling through the forest, and it's like just cool. Da, 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 but. Um, so yeah, I'm happy that that's that's done, um, and I'm currently working on Ghosts of Saltmarsh, um, which is like seven adventures from the Dungeons and Dragons world. So yeah, I've been well, I didn't do all of them. Some of them have already been done, but I'm doing the majority of them at the moment, um, which is really exciting because I get to play with sound. So yeah, that's what's been happening <laughs> in my end of uh, Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> Kabuki Kid says, Otisville. It's a tiny little place, Mr. Luther. Otisville. <laughs> That's very good, Kabuki. Things that make us go, hmm. Board Game News. Berkey and Badger reflect on the current events that are happening in the board game industry. Some may be good, some may be bad. But there are all things that make us go, hmm. Yeah, well, I have some things that are making me go, hmm. And uh, one of the things that is getting a lot of buzz yep. is you have some pictures, I think, to show of our, our memes coming up, but probably some other pictures. But there's a big hubbub about the BGG website and, more importantly, the BGG logo. Mm. Uh, the, the, the orange spot, as some have called it. Yes, the orange spot. It, it resembles many, many things. It is an abstract spot. It's like the black spot. Oh, Superman, still one of my favorite superheroes, Kabuki Kid says. And now he's even more super. He feels empowered because of this spot. <laughs> spot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the orange spot. The dreaded orange spot. Well, okay, so if it, unless you've been underneath a rock in the board gaming hobby or have not paid attention to any social media, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, BGG has been working on a rewet uh, implementation of the website to make some improvements and then a complete new rebranding. Well, when, oh, there's Jason Moen from... Big Kid Games, he's got this great big orange red beard, but now he has he's chosen to just wear the spot. Mm. The orange spot. But, uh, yeah, th <laughs> there you go. There's the new BGG page with its new icon. Um, There's the icon. Yeah, it hasn't changed much. It looks cleaner. The font looks nicer. Um, the icon from a distance looks a bit like a just a blob but it's not until you do get closer or look at it on the screen that you can actually see, actually see that it's like a, 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 a yeah what it's supposed to be oh kabuki kid says the funniest one was the picture where someone 
photoshopped on Trump's hair yeah. to the orange blob. <laughs> Believe me, this logo will be the most luxurious logo you've ever seen. Believe me, your ratings will go up if you use this orange spot. Yeah, I don't have a problem, uh, but obviously the internet's gone wild with it. Um... Well, that that was the thing that made me go home. I just like, you know, come on. Uh, change, I know everybody has a hard time with change. I don't necessarily like change with my operating system when I just figured out how to use it. So that irritates me. But on the other hand, I like improvements. Yeah. And I mean, let, let we got to say this. And wh- whether you like the new logo, whether you like the new thing or not, uh, it has its flaws. BGG is, is can be a challenge to navigate. I struggle with it. But you got to give these guys some credit. I mean, these guys work, have worked like dogs to create a place where every piece of information you can almost ever want to find is at. And, and you know, it's it's on BGG. And you you can find such a wealth of of information. And, and I realize that that this is probably very upsetting that somebody doesn't get the logo that they want. Uh, but it's not like your life ends. It's not like you have to should have to go to the emergency room. Mm. Um, and but <laughs> I'm, I'm making a little bit of fun of it. But the problem is I've been seeing people get online and just trash uh, BGG for how bad they are and how, you know, what were they thinking and who's the idiot that came up with this and saying horrible things and like, I remember the day when we used to just talk about board games and have fun. Yeah, yeah. but they, they've tried to make it a bit more generic, so it's more open to everybody. Um, because I think that before it was kind of like, yeah, that looks like a weird, geeky site with the um, the old is Eric. I think his name was. Yeah, Eric Martin. No, not Eric Martin. The Eric logo, which is oh Ernie, Ernie, Ernie. Sorry. And yeah, drove, and basically that's what the this fastest is. milk is it, in the West. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's basically a uh, what did you say? Ernie who drives the fastest milk cart in the West. <laughs> the, uh, Benny Hill song. Okay. <laughs> Those of you who know Benny Hill. Uh, whoop, went right over my head. Yeah. Benny oh, Hill. that's a good one. That's my that. favorite and, one. That one made me make me want to change my pants because I got very very <laughs> Yeah. Well, look at it. I mean, yeah. you got Board Game Geek. You got Facebook joining along with a nice abstract. Twitter, and th- very there's nice. There's a few like that as well, like um, the old UK Olympics logo, um, which was it is, yes, you, you see the resemblance, but um, <laughs> it's modern art. Well, I was wondering if we couldn't uh, if we couldn't redefine our logo somehow, and you know, like the King's Crown, because become abstract and yeah. your jester hat could become abstract and maybe even the castle and uh i think we need a re-wet a rebranding of berkey and badger as well yeah because we're no longer in medieval times even though we act like it. we need to get some banners made and, and tapestries built i think tapestries yeah uh so all of you photoshop wizards out there uh we are now commissioning a new abstract logo so join us set send your information to berkey at boardgametheater.com and we will gladly show all of the wonderful designs that you come up for us Mm. yes yes so moving right along (laughs) as i said at gen con one of one of the things that surprised me was the announcement of marvel splendor so I'm like, well, Splendor's like one of my favorite games and putting Marvel on it changes nothing. I know nothing about the game. I don't know if it changes any of the rules or any of the mechanics. Well, I don't think it changes any of the mechanics. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called Splendor. But um, that just made me go, ooh, interesting. They're Hmm. appealing to a different audience. Again, it's this, Hmm. uh, you know, just an image changes who looks at you. True. And that's what they're doing with Spender. Spender, when you look at the original cover box, it's kind of like elegant kind of art. And you think, hmm, yeah, what, what's that about? But when you see Marvel characters, you're instantly drawn because Marvel is like the biggest thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that made me go, hmm, from Gen Con. And also, Destiny's Time 
of Legends was announced at Gen Con as well, which is a uh, a game coming from Lucky Duck Games and Mythic Games. They are ah. um, they are using. You probably saw this with As. We it probably wasn't demoed on one of your tables, but um, no, he had Joan of Arc demoed on the Game Toppers. And yeah, stuff. this is the Joan of Arc universe, but it uses the Chronicles of Crime mechanism of hmm. an app. Um, okay. So I got to see. I, I was told about they were doing a project together way back in June. So uh, Leo and 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 Vincent were, were talking about this. They said, "Barry, we want you to do some music for our, our game." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, okay." And I'm like waiting for some news about what this game's about. And I saw it at Gen Con, and now I know what the game's about. And I'm going, "Okay, this is cool." So I'm excited about this um, because. Um, in Joan of Arc game originally they had cards with dialogue and questions on it and so obviously that's been transferred into the app but they've also changed the gameplay as well because you're not playing as any of the characters from the Joan of Arc game you're playing as like normal people who are witnessing these events okay. um, and it's how you interact with these main characters which creates the story. And it sounds like it's going to be like um, a Monkey Island. Secret of Monkey Island. Treasure of Monkey Island. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. Monkey Island. It's just called Monkey Island. You know, the point and click game where you're the young pirate trying to learn and you can pick up a monkey and try and put it in a letterbox. Or you can uh, pick up the snot and mix it in with the tissue and the, the hair from the Yeti to, to get past a puzzle. So it sounds like it's got that kind of element in it. Um, which is going to be really enjoyable, and it's all done on the app. Uh, plus, there is some physical, physical things. Let's uh, let's move right on to the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Yes, Kabuki Kid. <laughs> Guy Bush Threpweed. That's the hero. There it is. There it is. Just pushing buttons. Just <laughs> pushing buttons. Ah, oh, button man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's correct, Kabuki Kid. Uh, all right, we're going to talk about some of our games that we played. Give us a... Uh, a little bit of uh, what we're going to be doing here, Sir Badger. Okay. Um, the good, the not so bad, and the ugly is our first impression segment, where we 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 kind of do it game show styly. So um, we will describe a game vaguely to the other player, well, the other player, the other person, uh, and hopefully you guys at home, so you can try and guess what game we're talking about. And then uh, once you've guessed, we tell you, we, you try and guess if it, we think it's good, bad, and ugly. Good is a game that we're going to play again and again and again because we really enjoyed the first playthrough. A not so bad game is a game that we can take or leave, and an ugly is a, a game that there's no way in in ten heavens that we're going to to replay this this game uh, due to the fact that we had a really bad experience and that's a rare thing uh, it's very True. rare that we, we we do a bad but um you never know so we have a good the not so bad and the ugly all right so I will tell you about a game that I've been playing and this is a tile laying game um it is also a game by one of my favorite designers. So those that you follow know uh, I have several favorite designers. This, designers, this is one of them. Um, this is, uh, when I say tile laying game too, it's actually more, more of like a tile placement where you are building uh, an area to collect points. And this is a point salad type of game. Uh, the game uh, also allows you to score victory points in so many different ways by 
collecting these tiles that allow you to collect different resources that allow you to get other points on like a player board that everybody can join in on. So there's a little bit of a race to go over there and get those points and collect the resources before your enemy, I mean your opponent, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, is able to do so. Uh, it's it's It could really be any theme, but it has a, a kind of a Roman theme on the game. So do you have any clue of what I'm saying about this? What game this might be? Oh, you know, it sounds like so many other games that I'm thinking of. I couldn't. I can't put my name on. The, what was it? We played a game with Paul Brogan. It was um, sound a bit like that. No, it's not that one. No, it's not that one. Okay, that was Forum Tra- Tra- Trajam. Forum Tra- Tra- Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I haven't got a clue. I wonder if anyone in the chat has. The designer out. is Stefan Feld. Okay. I. Ooh. Produced produced by Aaliyah. You probably played this at Gen Con. No, nope, Dice Tower Con and before. Okay. I haven't got a clue. I can't think. The game is Carpa Diem. Carpa Diem. And Kabuki said it might have been Copenhagen. But no. no. Wrong. Okay. No, Carpe Diem. Um, I got to tell you, it it this here plays over. I believe it's six rounds. It's very unique because the, when you you have one action and you're going to you've got this circle of where all these four tiles are and there's several placements and you have to go from one to across or to another direction to pick up that that group and then from that location you can go to a different zone to pick up a tile. But you're trying to collect these little farms or, or these brick houses or uh, you're trying to get other kinds of things that, well, some of them will give you extra actions, for instance, to go pick another tile from this bottom track. Some of them, if you if you complete the little farm, you'll get, maybe you complete a water zone, you get extra fish. Well, those fish resources allow you to go over to this other place where you can get tracks. And there's a knowledge track, so... If you get certain buildings, you get that knowledge and, and that moves up and gives you points. So there's there's amazing. I believe we did play with the most recent uh, game. Uh, we just got it. Um, I, I'm, I, I could be wrong about that if there's something I don't know, but we recently played it. Um, Kabuki says, I saw Rado love the original rules, but dropped it heavily for him with the second edition rules. Well, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, all I can... Uh, what What do you think... Um, what do you think I think about this game, Sir Badger? It's a Stefan Fowl. You like point salads. This is probably a point salad, much like the other point salad games that he's done. So I'm going to say that you thought it was good. Good. Yep. Very good. Okay. Yay. Yep. Ta-da. Point for me. So we have a meme for the good. <laughs> I think it's... Uh, I think it's that, uh, I forget now which one it was. Yeah, it's that one. The BGG logo, Batman and Robin. The BGG logo, Batman or Robin says. Doesn't ruin your life. Take that. It doesn't ruin your life. No, it doesn't. Bam. Biff. Whammo. There you go. Well, that's the thing. I I love this game. Uh, We've played it several times. Kay King and her husband, uh, 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 oh gosh, I just lost his name. Andy came over and their family uh, when we were still running the Kickstarter for Game Toppers, and uh, we did a live show. And then afterwards, we played some games, and that's the one we played. Just so much fun! I played it several times with my wife and my daughter. Played it with Josiah. Um, it there's just so many different paths to victory. Um, I almost beat Josiah. I almost Ooh. beat Josiah. In fact, I thought I had him beaten. I almost beat him. Uh, I, it's just a cool... I, I don't know how to say it. Uh, just the way things come together make mm-hmm. you feel clever. If you can put those two pieces together and, you know, and even even if you don't win, you're happy because you've done so many things. Yeah. So I think it's a fantastic game. So, my turn. <laughs> Let's see if you guys can guess what game I'm talking about. In this game, 
it was taught to me in French, so if I muck up the, <laughs> the explanation, I apologise. Um, Aperitif. Mm. So in this game, uh, it's a kind of big group game uh, where one player is um, someone who's going to be giving a clue to uh, the other players of a, a word. But one of those players won't know what this word is. But yet they have to play the game as if they do know the word. Um, mm. Players are going to be playing cards which very much resemble cards from Dixit. And uh, they'll be trying to deduce who didn't get the memo of the word that our clue giver set up to, to say. Um, and so this is a kind of kind of deduction game, but you're using surreal art to deduce who is the actual liar. I know what this is, so I'm not going to guess no, because nobody I... on the chat's got it. Sorry, Ben, it's not medium. It's not medium. No. Can I? Can I? I'll, I'll give a clue. I think if I have it right. Go on then. Is it made by CGE? No. Oh, then I don't know. Oh. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a word game. It is a word game. I give a big clue away because clue is Dixit. There's Dixit cards involved. But it's also a game which. It's Dixit, but it mixes in Spyfall. So you have these two game oh, elements together. I heard about together. this. Yeah. I just heard about this. And it's coming from Blue Orange. Yeah, Kelly Hughes was just talking about this game, actually. Um, I believe he was teaching it. They went through a whole bunch of Blue Orange games. Oh, gosh. I forget the name of it, but yeah. Detective Club. Detective Club. Yes, it is literally that. It's not it's, what I was thinking, but it, okay. It is sticks it with Spyfall. One player is is going. Unlike Spyfall, where everyone gets a card and everyone's playing at the time, the 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 word maker is handing out these little notepads to all the players, uh, but one of them hasn't got his word on it or her word on it, and. That player is then kind of not really playing. They're more observing. But at the same time, they will be selecting two cards because you're going to have a handful of cards and you're going to have to d decide a word from those cards. And so it's like you're looking at the cards and you're trying to deduce what the words are by playing the card. And then you go around and you explain what word you think it is to the other players. And so there's there's this, this element of, you know, as I said, spyful where you're trying to keep in with the in crowd but at the same time um you're trying to be clever as well because i found that when i played most of the group made played the cards that were very obvious so it was like if the 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 the, the word was fruit they'd play a card with fruit in it and when you see three cards with fruit in it and you are the person that doesn't know what the word is you kind of like go okay yeah i think the word's fruit oh i've got, I've got some fruit here boom um, sometimes you don't have an image with the word in mind if you if you have the word. So if you have the word fruit and you go, okay, I've got no fruit in there. Um, I'm going to play this card because it looks like uh, there's an orange sun. So it's like an mm -hmm. orange. There you go. Or there's a monkey and monkeys eat bananas. So, But as long as your story kind of concludes, you can try and throw the other players off that you are actually so the person it, without the word. Does it help you? Like the, one of the problems I found with Spyfall for me personally, I know people like it, but I had a hard time being able to look at that initial picture of Spyfall and be able to pull all that stuff out without contemplating it more. And then people knew what you were doing. So you kind of gave it away. Yeah. Um, and then I had a hard time seeing across the table sometimes with, you know, with cards and whatnot. So does that, does this fix that a little mm, bit by having the card or not? Not really, you, because <laughs> when I played, we played a seven-player game, and four out of the seven times, I was the player that didn't have 
well, four out of the six technically, because obviously I had to do it. Four times I didn't have the word. So four times I was like the spy, so to say. And mm. at first it was like, I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the other player's cards, and especially if, like, maybe the, the word giver is the player on your right, you are the first player, so you're playing the first card, and it's like, well, what card do I play? And so, um, yeah, there is some deduction, but, you know, it, it suffers from the same thing as Spyfall. If you are the first player to be spoken to, and you haven't got a clue, it kind of, like, shows on your face. And, I mean, the first two times people knew that I was talking out my behind when it come to explaining what my cards are and what the word was. Um, but mm. after a while, I was able to start bluffing because um, I was throwing the bluff off because other players were playing bad cards, which had nothing to do with the word, but they were making up these stories for why the, it was that word. And so from bad playing on their part, I was able to, you know, push the blame so- and, and get some points. I'm going to guess that you think this is not so bad. No, I think it's good. You think it's good? It's good. Wow. I mean, I haven't played Spyfall. It's a game that I've always wanted to play. I like Dixit a lot. Um, you know, I it probably sounds like a quite a little bit negative about the game because I was playing with a group of French people and it at first it was a bit hard to decipher what words were and... Um, the, the kind of the feel of the game because I mean yeah it was explained to me but sometimes it takes me you know about five ten minutes into the game to understand all oh, right this is how it works um but um yeah it was it was good I really enjoyed it I mean I wouldn't mind playing it again it had um a lot of creativity you had to be really imaginative as I said if you haven't got cards with the word on it you have to find something which will convince the other players that yeah that I, I have got the word uh, but, and these cards are the the right cards but you know it's it's storytelling plus this um hidden traitor spy thing so yeah mm-hmm. i enjoyed it detective cool card. it looks looks nice hmm. Well, I have another game uh, that that we were that I actually played at Dice Tower Con. Yep. And this has kind of a nautical, piratey, smuggling, Caribbean type of feel to it. It's an older game. Uh, it's a game that I had heard about but had never played. Um, a very avid gamer friend of mine, uh, Trey. Lennox and his wife, uh, Mariana, and a couple of their friends um, invited me to play with them. So we played it five player. I've never played it before. Uh, it has kind of a economic element to it because you're you're picking up and picking up items and then you're selling them in this entire uh, nautical type of theme. There's several different places that you can go. Uh, but there are dangers in the deep. Ooh. So tell me uh, if you have any ideas. This was made in 2005 to give you a little bit of a clue. Okay. And a fellow Frenchman, uh, Bruno Fiduti, was involved. Was involved. There's actually three designers involved. No, it's not Jamaica, because Jamaica has no pickup and delivery system. I was thinking no. Black Fleet. But now you put no. a year on it, it's definitely not Black Fleet because that was like 2015 or so. Um, Pirates Cove? No. Good thought. Merchants and Marauders? No. No. Another good guess. I am. Um... I would say it's. I would say it's not as heavy as Merchants and Marauders. Uh, probably in that family weight type type of game. Mm, I can see the book us about an hour, hour and twenty minutes. Box like it, but I can't think. Mm, I might have to pass to <clears throat> save time here. Kabuki, got any thoughts? Let's have a look at the comments. Uh, ben, ben Lunches ben, says Ben Ben had a couple good shots. Jaws, not Jaws. Matches in more orders. Nope, nope. Great game, love it. Guesses. Uh, Kabuki stepped away. No problem. Uh, 
Well, it is the game Key Largo. Mm. Key Largo. You're basically picking up some of this deep sea uh, scuba diving equipment that you can buy and that allows you to get another diver. And these divers are funny characters. Uh, And then you've got these different zones that you can go over to these uh, sunken treasures and you can go in, into there and, and there's different treasures that you're going to pick up. Some of them can be jewels. Some of them can be money. Uh, and you're going to need to trade uh, some of the jewels or some of the artifacts to get. And what's, there's a really unique mechanism. If one person goes to one of the action selection zones or worker placement zones, if you will, um, <coughs> excuse me. If one person's there, you're going to get the most. If two people are there, you're going to get less. If you're three people are there, you're going to get even less. So you don't want to go to a place that somebody already is. So it has that mechanism, kind of like Pirate's Cove, where uh, you don't want to go. You're trying to guess where other people are going. And you've got these cards, or a deck of five cards, I think it is, or maybe it's six. And you choose two of these locations. You have a morning and a night card and you play it and so you're trying to do the opposite so you can maximize the the area that you're going to either be purchasing gear or that you're going to be trading or that you're going to be converting into money and bottom line at the end of the game whoever has the most money wins so what do you think yeah the art is super wacky but it's it's kind of interesting actually so what do you think i think of that I think that you think that it's not so bad. Um, I don't get the impression that you you enjoyed it that much, but you thought it was okay. And yeah, you've probably played games like it, but better. Kind of like Citadels or... <laughs> I fooled you. Oh. <laughs> you know why pirate jokes are funny, don't you? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna bleep you out now. <laughs> You're now muted. <laughs> He's, he can mute me. He can say, oh, I have are. the power. He can't, he can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't you, hear you. Well, the audio feed is going to get, you're going to hear it on the audio <laughs> recording on iTunes. Oh, zoot. Oh, wow. So, uh, no, we loved it. It was so much fun. It was just that I love economic games. I love uh, stockpile and speculation and, so, you know, some of these games. I love that that type of element um there was there was that unknown whether that you know that sea monster is going to come up and whether they're going to you know knock out one of your divers and you kind of need to have two divers so that you can collect at the same pace that the other people so you can get a a trident and you can that'll help protect you and you can get an extra air hose so that you can go deeper and go over to the other uh shipwrecks to get more uh but it's more dangerous yeah uh, it was just super fun. Everybody just loved it. And this is an older game that uh, I think hasn't been talked a lot about. And it probably could be have a makeover. Yeah. Um, I I kind of enjoyed the art, but you can tell it's really dated. But as far as the gameplay, uh, there was three designers. It was Paul Ranellas, Bruno Fiduti, and Mike Selnicker. Mm. And I had a hard time finding who made the game. And it was um, Paizo. Is, is all I could find for the actual publisher. All right. So, anyway, Key Largo. Enjoyed it a lot. My turn. See, I've turned the Your chat turn. I've turned the chat off, so I can't see the chat. Oh, why, why have I turned the chat off? I, I need to see the chat, see if you guys can guess which game this is. Okay. <laughs> um, in this game, your character will have some statistics which you have to... Um, you have to meet to score points. And you're going to be trying to do this in the typical kind of Dungeons and Dragons style by rolling dice and then putting those dice into statistics like, um, by well Kabuki, um, like charisma and strength and dexterity. Um, hmm. Do I need to go on? I know what it is. Sitting right there. Yeah. Can you see it? <laughs> <laughs> That's it uh, uh, it's the game role player from Keith Mateka, 
from uh, Thunderworks Games. Thunderworks is a game topper affiliate. The quick little little interjection story uh, at Gen Con. Uh, John Rott from Gatekeeper Games has a Kickstarter panel, and he had industry uh, professionals from different aspects of the industry on this panel. And I was actually asked for the large projects uh, to be on the Kickstarter panel. And Keith Mateka from Thunderworks Games was actually sitting right next to me. We're good friends. And uh, so he had, you know, from a publisher standpoint, and I was from large product production standpoint and all of those kind of things. And we had an amazing time with about 50 people who actually came to the to the seminar there at Gen Con, which was really, really cool. But we talked a lot about all the expansions that he has for this game. So go ahead. Okay, yeah. So Role Player, which is... A, basically a dice warning game and then you allocate the dice into your character sheet and as I said you've got to try and match uh, the, the the levels that they set so if your character needs to be level level 18 on charisma you need to have 3d6 to equal 18 um, there is some manipulation that you can do during the game if you fill up a line um, which is quite nice because then you can plan but you also have um, an alignment. You also have um, uh, the typical drafting. Kind of, yeah, you also have your normal kind of uh, characteristics as well, which you'd find in D and D. So I was a bard. I was a dragon bard who was neutrally aligned. And you've got all these little things to try and manage as well. Your 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 my bard gave me a power. There was another characteristic. I can't remember what it was. But then you got to try and get your alignment correct to get you the maximum point. And you did that by uh, either buying cards and equipment, which would move this little cube in a nine, uh, three by three grid, which was nine squares, and uh, and that was it. It was rolling dice and then manipulating your board and trying to get it to get maximum points every time, and and buy equipment, which kind of worked really well. So, what do you think? I think of this game. Yes, Kabuki is dice drafting. Well, I have to, gosh, it, in my opinion, it's a fantastic game. The new expansion, the Minions expansion, uh, allows you to build up your character and then actually go after these Minions, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And then now the new expansion uh, looks really exciting as well. Uh, I have to say that you think it's good. Yes, I, I did enjoy it. It is good, yes. Uh, so well done to Keith. Keith was on our last show, so if you want to go back and listen to that episode and hear about oh, yeah. all the new things that he introduced into the new Kickstarter version, which is no longer on Kickstarter anymore. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, the I think you can late pledge still. Yeah. Um, my one, My one reservation is I'm one of these players that I do my stuff and I plan ahead. And there was a lot of waiting around as your players are deciding which dice they're going to take. So it decides the turn order. And it's like, okay, right. If they take this dice, I'm going to take that dice. If they take that dice and that dice and that dice is gone and those are left, then I'll take that one. So I'm like, in my head, I've got my my dice already picked out which one I want to take and which one's the priority one. But other players were taking their time and kind of dragged the game out. Um, I, I think they were all playing to maximize where I was just playing to to get the feel of the game. And as I said, I, I planned before. So I had my, in my I looked at my board and when you assign your first lot of dice, I had them all planned out what I was going to do. I thought, well, I don't need that power because that power is rubbish. That power is pretty good. That colored dice is in the right space. That's the other thing that you could do. You get If you get the right colored dice in the right spaces, you get points as well. And again, you get points if you've got more of your own color because each class has a different color dice. Um, so there's lots. It's a point salad. It's, there's points everywhere, um, mm. which is fantastic. And it's just how you get them. But I found the game did drag because I was waiting, it, you know, because I was planning very, very quickly. Um, but, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was, it was, I felt at the end when I put that last dice in, I felt satisfaction. This is my character. The dragon mm -hmm. bard, who is neutrally aligned, and yes, I, I think I won. No, I didn't. No, I didn't win. 
Yeah, I, I really love it. I actually have a custom play mat for it. And the new Kickstarter, it's got a big deluxe box that you can fit all the expansions in. And I, I just think that's really cool. I, um, I think I, have, you haven't played the Minions expansion no, yet, no, have you? I just played the base game. Uh, it was in French. Um, so, Keith, if you're watching, smack the publisher's bum because there were spelling mistakes and spelling errors in the French version, apparently. So. Ah. And here we are in the woods of Evergreen with our good king, King Berkey, and his faithful little pet, Badger, as they take a stroll along these wonderful parts of Babylon, looking at the wonderful trees and reminiscing about those wonderful games from those past eras, even maybe before these trees were planted. And they are going to be talking about these games like they still like to play. And uh, this time on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning, they're going to be talking about games which came from the year 2009. (laughs) So, the Woods of Evergreen are games from 2009 that still hold up to today's wonderful games. Yes. Well, that, that what right. we think still holds up. In it's what we think. Yeah. And that means that they do hold up. <laughs> yeah. Because we think so. <laughs> very, very true. Yes, yes. Well, I think that there's a game. Uh, this this particular game is, is an area control game. Okay. And it's by one of my favorite favorite publishers uh it's one of the companies that brought out family games every year and and they uniquely only do one sometimes two games in a year uh but i you know we we really cut our teeth on so many of these wonderful games by days of wonder (gasps) and my my number one pick is the game small world Ooh, yeah I love Small World. I love the fact that you have all these different races and you can combine these two races with these cool little cardboard thick tokens that actually put them together and and cause them to do something unique. And then when they go in to do area control, but you can't keep them too long because sooner or later you got to get yourself another race to come back in. And those races are kind of on a drafting board that you can go and grab and and the game is always different uh, when you play it. They've, they've had a lot of expansions to Small World uh, so that you can get... To, I think the original game, if I remember right, has two sides to the board. Or no, it's for the different player counts. Yeah. Uh, but there's Underground, I think, was one of them. And there's a couple others. Um, I haven't actually played a lot of the expansions, but I played the one one time that un- I think it's Underground. Uh, love that game. It's just got a great feel to it. They made a super deluxified version that was like 300 bucks or something. They did, yeah. And that was really cool. I love getting the dwarves and, and uh, you know, being the dwarves and then having some kind of skill. Yeah. I forget what it is, whether it's magic or Smith, something like many that. Many dwarves or undead dwarves. Or, yeah, right. Yeah. The skeletons, the undead. Yeah, Kabuki said 400 bucks if she recalled for that great big fancy version. Yeah. It was really quite amazing. Yeah. But yeah, I would agree that is a, a good evergreen title, which has withstood the test of time. It's still talked about. It's Great art. Yeah, it's still played. Um, it's not an amazing game for myself. I, I, I do like playing it. It's not a game that I'm going to jump to. But um, but you obviously think it it is. Uh, it's been a long time since I've played it, mm. uh, but I do I do enjoy it. Yeah. So yeah. All right. What's one for you? What's one for me? Now well, I like island games. Island games. Yeah. Oh. I like pina coladas. This is a treasure hunting one on an island called. 
Tobago. Oh, Tobago. Tobago. I have that game on my shelf of shame. Oh, right. I've got it here. Sorry. <laughs> I've never played it. <laughs> yes, from 2009. It's an amazing... Um, I love this game. This is like one of my highest rank ranked games. I just love playing this game. It is... You're playing clues which will lead, shrink the map down to one location where the treasure is and then you've got to get to the treasure to dig it up and there's sometimes there's curses and there's a lovely kind of like um, auction, no, it's not really an auction but there's a, a method of getting the treasure if loads of people have played clues for that treasure. So the more clues you've played the, 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 the more treasure you're going to get but there's more chance of you getting a curse as well. Um, it's It's got this, this basic board game feel from the 90s which I love uh, the wooden cars the, the, the wooden palm trees um, and it is just it's just a hidden treasure it's still talked about especially nowadays because the cryptid game came out which is very similar mechanic um, mm. but this game is just a I think it's gonna it's one of those treasures that is well hidden but it's still an evergreen people will still still pick this up I've seen it on shelves as well in game store okay still here in France so uh and people do talk to, about it with a lot of passion yeah I picked it up on a math trade for BGG several years ago and it's just sat there it's totally... oh it is as long as it's still green in the box it's still well I'm glad it's still evergreen it's, uh, it's I now, now I want to play that it's definitely an oh. evergreen it, okay it I have timeless. another one you know it feels it doesn't feel like it's, you know, you can say it's a game from the 90s, 2000s, or 2010. Well, I have a game. We're going to each do three. Yep. Um, there's a lot more than, than three games in 2009 that I think hold up. Yeah. But this is a game that, again, it's area control, uh, but it has a little bit different mechanism of one of my favorite games, but it's very similar, and it's similar to the game Kemet. Uh, which I love Kemet. I think mm. Kemet is just brilliant. Uh, I, I don't know what it is about that particular game and that battle system and that I love, but this game here is called Cyclades. And I know people argue about how to pronounce Cyclades. Cyclades, all that, whatever you want to say. But this has got that whole, you know, Greek mythology uh, aspect and there's... I have several maps maps for it so that you can have this different island that you can go to and just the movement mechanics and I have the Titans expansion. Um, I mean, at, 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 we liked it so much on the first play that we almost thought it was better than uh, Kemet and Kabuki is saying it's supposed to be called Comet. 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 Kemet, 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 Kemet. Oh, oh! Not I'm secret. never gonna, I'm never gonna get that right. Kemet, yeah. Kemet, Comet. Anyway, Cyclades. I. This game is just fantastic. The way the army movement is, the mm. way uh, you go from island to island, uh, the different uh, abilities that some of these these god tokens give you. Uh, with your movement or with your army size, uh, the battle system with these cards that you play down, um, I just think it's it's timeless. There's no reason to upgrade it even. I just think it's a great game. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I haven't played Cyclades. I've played Kemet, and I it just sounds like it resembles it so much. Um, and as you say, timeless. It is. Yeah. It really does. It it adds a few different things. I think mostly that I remember is is mostly the way movement and and some of those things take place. And you've got a different theme. Yeah. You know, your yeah. different environment. So my number two is one that Kabuki's said in the chat. It is called The Resistance. Oh this that game. Is yeah, this is a game that is still played a lot here in France. I've seen it a lot in the gaming groups. And it's it's just one of those it's the perfect werewolf game um but without elimination it's the, it's the communication between the players and 
who's who's working on what team and you got to try and figure it out by the things that they do and the things that they say and how they sabotage do they did they sabotage the mission or was it someone else um it's a, a bluffing game it's 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 uh we we spent one night playing it like four or five times in a row with the same group of people we just loved it so much um and we had such a laugh because all these kind of like in jokes came out about you know who's lying and who's not lying and and especially if you role play it as well and you add some story to your missions which is quite fun as well it's like okay right this mission is we must go in and steal donald trump's toilet uh, <laughs> he goes oh i couldn't steal it but i couldn't get the night off my wife had me fixing our own toilet it's like ah so yeah a fantastic game uh, I, I like the avalon version yeah yeah, I haven't played that one, but that that has a, a bit more added onto it, doesn't it? It has a few extra characters with special powers. Um, yeah, because, just a little bit of that. Yeah, there's one Arthurian. person that plays Merlin, um, and right. so they can win a different way to the 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 team of Camelot or the team of the other team. So, but yeah, that's a great game. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic game. From two thousand, I have a game. I I don't know if you've played this. This one probably might be a little obscure. Yeah, go on. nowadays, but but this game uh, is a dice rolling game, and it's a Western theme game. Oh, d- d- Dice Town. Dice Town. Wow. And uh, I tell you what, my my one daughter Hannah that d- did all of our graphics and stuff for our Kickstarter page, she hates this game. <laughs> Um, there's this one place where you have the queens and the, the, all the dice have all these poker uh, card, you know, emblems on there and you're rolling and you're trying to, whoever has the best hand and you're rolling kind of three times, kind of like Yahtzee-ish style. Mm-hmm. But you can go to these different places that all give you different things. Well, if you go to the queen, that's the one that the queens, I forget the name, it's the outpost or something like that. You can steal something from someone and oh that makes her so mad yeah. um, <laughs> so she hates that because you can't control that um, but other than that little bit of that take that that's in the game just fun dice rolling little bit of bluffing kind of you know which resource are you going to take uh, just fun accessible cool fun old west cartoon art uh, we have the expansion for it too, which is pretty good. A little bit complicates it a little bit, but uh, other than that, it's just good fun. I think it still holds up. I really like Dice Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've seen it again. It's, that's a board game, cafe game. That is that I've seen that when I go into the cafe in Reims, I've seen people just playing that, and it's like, wow, they're still playing that game. And it's like, yeah, because it's it's simple and it's fun and it's just push your luck whenever you want. So, yeah, Ben, how do you do it? You go into the search menu up here. You push advanced search. You type in the year that you want. If you want to find yeah, out. Yeah, I had to figure that out too, Ben yeah. Kabuki. So you put, the, you put the range to the year. So 2009 to 2009, push enter, and then it lists Boom. all the games from 2009. So now there, there's a perfect example of what we were talking about with BGG. You know, they've, they've made some changes. That advanced search used to be a link that you could read. Yeah. So now you just click in the box to find it. It's still there, but once you do that advanced search, it's pretty friendly. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can find really nicely. So yeah. wonderful site, but sometimes the intuitive nature of finding those buttons is difficult. Yeah, they've kept it clean, though. I, I prefer it hidden to, in, in again, the list of... You know, do you want to search by board but game But I couldn't artists? find it. I couldn't find it. No, it's not until you accidentally click. I clicked. I it. clicked every other thing, and I couldn't find it until I we clicked in that field. Yeah. Anyway. So my third game, as you can probably see, with a nine point two rating, is Dominion Intrigue. Dominion is just such a big game, anyway. Um, it, people don't talk about it as much, but there is. You know, at the time, it was the best game, and many games. Well, there's not many deck building games anymore, are there? You don't hear about a lot. We're gonna play one today, uh, which is the DC deck builder. Oh, right. but uh, yeah, this is still an evergreen. I, I've seen people play this. 
not as much because you know people want to add theming but this game it has still withstood the test of time because of its simple rules um and the, the amount of replayability due to the fact that you can mix in different cards from different sets um intrigue for me it is the slightly better version than the base game because it adds a lot more nastiness and backstabbing cards um, the wife likes doing that as well she she her strategy is you know get the sorcerer and then uh place as many curse, curses on me as possible but she doesn't <laughs> need the game to do that <laughs> Awesome. So there you go. Well, is that the three? There you go. Six games. Yay. I picked Small Worlds, Small Worlds, Cyclades, Dice Town, and you picked Tobago, Tobago, sorry, Resistance, and Tomato. Dominion Intrigue. Dominion Intrigue. Let's have a look there at the go. chat. What did Kabuki put? Da, 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 da. She put it, some games. It's up a ways. Up a ways, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah we got into advanced search. Yes. Um, so she put... Um, Thunderstone. J Japur. 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 Yeah. Cards so Against Humanity. She put Resistance <laughs> as well. Cards Against Humanity. Thunderstone. Right, she's got to be joking about that. Yeah. 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 It has, in a way, yeah. withstood the test of time, though, hasn't it, as an evergreen? Because they bring out a new version of Thunderstone. There's not been a new version of Dominion. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, nice nice going there, um, AK. Well, before we get into our babble topic, we want to thank our fine sponsor, Arcane Wonders. I tell you what, Arcane Wonders has been doing some amazing things. Arcane Wonders came out with this new game that is called Volcanic Isle. You can see right here, um, the the table presence of this game is just absolutely spectacular. Where you've got these uh, these uh, tokens that you're moving around to the different parts of the island, and then you have these geysers that come, and you're building up uh, your uh, villages to collect points. Uh, was able to play that at Origins. Had a lot of fun playing that. In addition. Uh, at Gen Con, they released the brand new game, Dragon Scales, designed by Richard Launius. And this here is a Dice Tower Essential game. Uh, Dragon Scales is a remake of the, of the Defenders of the Realm type of game, or Dragon Rampage, uh, that Eagle Griffin had. And now this, this game has been redone and, and slightly rethemed with some new character archetypes. Uh, the table presence of this game looks fantastic. Um, I actually had the opportunity to play test that with Richard Lanius and Brian Pope, Trey Lennox at Dice Tower Con two years ago, and it just came to uh, Gen Con. It was a huge success. They sold most of all their copies and they had a lot of them there. They also have a brand new game called Architecture uh, that is there, which is a smaller card game uh, card game that you can check out uh, from Arcane Wonders. And lastly, I want to just talk about they have a brand new Kickstarter coming in November, and this is for the game Foundations of Rome. And this is an Emerson Matsuchi game. Emerson designed Century Spice Robe and so many Spectre Ops and so many amazing games. Well. This You should see the miniatures of this city-building game that Arcane Wonders has come in. Game Toppers is actually going to be working alongside them to make a custom 3mm premium mat. Uh, you should see the amount of work, the size of the box that this thing is coming in. It's huge. Uh, it's Emerson Matsuchi. What do you say? Yeah, it's huge. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's one of the nicest guys, a uh, fantastic designer, a uh, lot of credibility. Uh, I'm super thrilled uh, to be a part of that game. I think that's going to be a huge hit for Arcane Wonders coming up on Kickstarter in November. Check them out at arcanewonders.com.
And now it's time for the Babble 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 Berkey and Badger's Board Game Babble Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble Show. Where you know there was a time that you used to grab your guitar and we would just jam and we would just flow you know <laughs> just flow we would and yeah and where did the where did those times go it's those a, were good times they were good times but we were a lot more off the hook there i think we're trying to stick this, to the script more often than not stupid script <laughs> stupid script oh dear oh well <laughs> we got to get through the stupid list that's the thing that's the thing I got Who writes this list anyway? I'm an idiot. Anywho. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to find a new writer. Yeah, maybe someone who's not so much of a joker and a clown. <laughs> no, so tell us about the Babel topic. What are we talking about We're talking about, about unboxed. Unboxing. I mean, everyone knows how much I hate and despise unboxing videos. But we're not going <laughs> to delve into that. KK has got it right, man. Yeah, vamp. Yeah, yeah. That 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 easy cash grab that even the big channels are doing now. It's like <laughs> it's like showing off. It's like here you go. Look what I got. I got this game. Woo! I don't know how to play it. I haven't read the rules. I'm just gonna open up and show you everything, and they get two thousand clicks, which will give me at least five dollars the this month on top of the other two thousand dollars I get from. YouTube, yeah, right. Well, so you're talking about an unboxing video. And I, honestly, this thing, you know, I think there's a purpose for unboxing because sometimes we just want to see what's in the box. Yeah. And and from the back of the box, sometimes you can't tell. Mm. So I think there's value to seeing somebody take out the components and you can look at them. Um, but what blows my mind, what frustrates me is that you have reviewers. I don't consider myself a reviewer. I'm kind of a first impression flavor guy here. Love the hobby. I'm an enthusiast. I don't consider myself a, a high quality reviewer. I'm more of a content creator. But um, Barry, I consider you a much more professional reviewer. I try. Because when, when you do reviews, they're they're so thoughtful. I mean, you've played the game at several player counts. You've You've thought about how you want to communicate what you liked about the game, what you didn't like. You've 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 researched the rules. You've done a lot of time, and and then and then you put all this effort into the professional video editing and the amount of time you spend. And, and so many other reviewers do the same thing. But what happens is these b- unboxing folks they just come out there, throw a camera on, and unbox, and then they get two hundred thousand hits or ten thousand hits, and you know, here you've put all this work into this thing that gets, you know, seven, eight hundred hits or something. Um, that drives me nuts. Yeah. I mean, Dragon Strike, old Jeremy S- S- Salinas. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He used to, the Man versus Meeple. Yeah, he, yeah, good guy. Long time ago, he used to do these really professional look at these components of this game videos, and they were beautiful. I used to watch them. They weren't up these meaningless unboxing videos. He would give a nice narration. He'd take out the pieces. Mm-hmm. They'd be displayed or painted, and this it would just look gorgeous. Everything he did was gorgeous. Now that's what I call a box opening. If you want to check, like Kabuki says. Make sure that you've got all the components in your box the same as what everyone else has got. Or if you want to just look at what is in the in the game itself, then that's a good way. But I just find them shallow and soulless because, yeah, you, you oh, it's, this is a nice mini, he says with the camera blurred. Um, no, it's not a nice mini. I want to know if it's a nice game more than I wanted a nice mini. I was frustrated when Batman got delivered from Monolith. Mm. It was like 28 videos popped up within the first week and they were all unboxing videos. At what point is someone going to watch your unboxing video over someone else's? And at what point is, you know, the guy who did it first, is he going to, is he still going to have more views than everyone else? It's like... See some reviews. Well, the frustration is that they have seemingly success with it, and, and it's like you work really hard to do something thoughtful and well done, 
And then someone just, Joe Schmo comes along and here's my box and yep. look at all the goodies. Yep. And and like you say, you really don't know anything about the game necessarily. Usually those unboxing videos are really crappy quality too. <laughs> Camera moving all around and, you and know, just... Yeah. yeah, it's filled with meaningless tripe as well. There's nothing really interesting that the person says unless they make a gaffe and they say weird words and then it's quite amusing, but... Well, I, I, I was uh, listening to Marty uh, Connell from Rolling Dice and Taking Names, and he was talking to Tony about these reaction videos. Well, I hadn't heard of them, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. so so I go online and I watch this guy react to some of the couple of these songs that, you know, he's a rapper, but he listens to these country songs and Leonard Skinner song. And um, I mean, I, I got to admit, I was kind of captivated for it by a while. Um, I, 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 it just his reactions to him listening to music he hadn't heard before mm-hmm. was really amusing. Yeah, and and he's getting like seven hundred thousand hits, a million hits on some of these things, and I mean, his Bohemian Rhapsody. I forget the guy's name now, but um, a million hits, and all he's doing is listening and reacting, and so there's. <laughs> It just feels like there's no effort, and yet he he's achieving success with it. Um, and that's the way I feel with these unboxing. Just anybody can do it, and it just doesn't matter anymore. And it to me, it diminishes the quality effort that's being. You know, maybe I'm talking about it too much, even, but yeah. I don't know. It frustrates me. Yeah, it frustrates me. So let's move on, shall we? <laughs> well, but but it, I think there is value. Um, to being able to see what's in the box. Yeah, but you can get that from a tutorial video or from a review video where they will actually say, okay, this game is good, this component's a bit bad, it doesn't work, you get lost, the, the your eye glisses over that part of the board so you can't see that properly. I mean, I watched one from Richard this morning, which was which I found was pretty useful when he talked about the 10th anniversary, 10th anniversary edition of Pandemic and there was a root missing from the board between two cities oh but see there that's a little different you know if you've got something special that you really want to show off those components and unbox that that seems a little bit different to me like a 10th anniversary so you could because that's the whole point it's a tricked out version yeah you know now they now they have the new tenth and or uh, is it tenth anniversary or comparison uh, video Port, Port, Puerto Rico yeah. they just announced that they're remaking, but it's not going to be like that great big anniversary set that they made. Mm-hmm. It's going to be more retail accessible. Well, I already have the game, so I kind of do want to see what's in there, yeah. and I don't need a review. Yeah, yeah. But uh, again, a comparison video where someone's got two versions of the game. And they go, oh, well, in this version is good, isn't it? That, that's not too bad. That, that, you know, that's 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 informative. Whereas yeah, if someone that makes just sense. someone just opens their box and goes, look what I got. I got this game before all you people. And oh, I'm, gonna sh- I'm just going to make lots of uh, clicks from this well, because I'm showing you. Oh, look, there's this figure here. Whoa, and this, oh, this comes with boards as well. What did you expect to find in the box? A dead well, rat? Well, speaking of, <laughs> look what I have here. Um... It has been the the tradition at Gen Con that people would show their Gen Con halls. Or oh, yeah. if they go to a big convention, they have a hall to show. Well, we were talking about this last night at supper. And people would, would I mean, our, we were talking about our first Gen Con and how we totally filled this Buick LeSabre with four guys and all of the games that we had. Cool, uh, Queen Games had this deal where... You buy a game and you get a $20 gift certificate off the next game and you kept doing it every day. So we all had duplicates of all these really good queen games, actually. Um, and then that was we got Shogun and, and we got uh, uh, e- e- Echoes. No, not Echoes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we got a bunch of, bunch of good stuff. Speculation was one of them. Um, but we had so many games from Gen Con that we had to take all of our clothes out of our suitcases. I'm not BSing you. So, because you can tuck underwears and socks, you can tuck them underneath the couch, underneath the chairs, you know? <laughs> and we made use of every ounce of space so that games were inside the luggage and games were in the trunk. And I mean, that back end of that car was like this. We're just cruising down the road. <laughs> 
because we had this huge Gen Con haul. Mm. Uh, I sent you a picture, uh, oh, yes, you Barry, did. of a Gen Con haul. There's a couple things. It's sitting, the one that's sitting on my table, <laughs> on my tapa. And there's going to be a game in there that you're going to be actually pretty excited that to see that I uh, acquired. You acquired Batman. It's sitting. Oh, it's over in the corner. Yeah. Well done. Quite a deal. There's two big honking boxes. Now I could open those and unbox them and show you all the minis, but that would just irritate you. But look at that. I got. I got uh, uh, the city game uh, the city from game. Breaking Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 God of War from Come On. Yeah, I played that. I, <laughs> Very hard. <laughs> there's there's Dragon Scales from Arcane Wonders okay, and yeah. Architecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the back there, we've got the new Run, Fight, or Die revis- rever- re- uh, revised game from Gray Fox Games. Mm-hmm. And look at this one. Copenhagen Deluxe from Queen Games. Oh, right. And then we've got a Merlin expansion. So I'm bringing these games back to the booth at the end of the show. And I've been complaining about all the games that I haven't been able to play that are on my shelf of shame. So Josiah looks at me and he goes, Dad, I don't think you understand how this works. If you want to get rid of games, you are not supposed to get more games. Yeah. But that's a small haul compared to what I used to get. No. Oh. What what do you do? Do you when you get games? Do you unbox them or do you leave them in their film? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I wonder what I, I wonder. I know, like Jesse Shakey is a good friend of mine. He helped me the first year we did Game Toppers at Gen Con, and he tells me the minute he game gets his game, one of the funnest things for him is to open that game up, punch it all out, get it organized. Give it a sniff. Uh, he loves doing that. I love doing that as well. That's what I do. I get the game. This is Dead of Winter, which I've had for like nearly two years. I still haven't played it, but I've opened it. I've opened it. I've punched it. I've placed it on the table. I've read the rules. I've sniffed it. And I just need to play it. The only thing with my Rodney Smith card in it. And, hmm. You know, unless I'm getting ready to play it. I don't do that because I don't know when I'm going to get to it and I don't want the cardboard to warp and you know and sometimes you know it's like I'm not going to get to it and and I don't know sometimes I've played other people's copy of the game and then I've got a game that's in shrink um I just flat out have too many stinking games that I'm not playing mm. uh, and it's it's due to due to my my you know the business and all that stuff in my my season of life but nonetheless, I know that a lot of these games are fantastic and that I'm hopefully will be able to get to them. Um, but yeah, I, I typically don't do that. Yeah, there's, there's nothing worse than... That's the thing. It's, for me, it's like I get the game, I unbox it, I read it, I remember the rules. The next day, I remember the rules and I think, oh, I'm going to play it tomorrow with so-and-so. I remember the rules and then that day comes and they can't make it. And it's like... And yeah. then a month or so later, they do come around and they go, right, let's play that game now. And it's like, oh, God, I've got to read the rules again. <laughs> Where is my so life going? <laughs> does it go out of your mind? Yeah. Uh, does the excitement go out um, after you've opened it? No. Do you lose the excitement if you don't get to it right away? Is it no, kind of out really. of mind? No, not really. I mean, I've got Joan of Arc here as well. That's another game that oh. it's taken me like two days to unbox Joan of Arc. Um, I'm going to get that. And I, I need to play it because I, I just have this urge to play it. It's the, the stories, the minis, the the way they, the actions interact with each other. And I, I tried playing it solo with the rule book and no, it wasn't. I need someone there. I need someone there to remember the rules as we are discovering them. And so it got this feedback. Oh, you can't do that, remember? Oh, yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Um, so hmm. for me, th- th- that's a problem. But with some other games, it's quite easy to to open it, put it on the table, play solo for a couple of rounds, and then remember those rules. It's like tiny towns. You know, we we Paul taught us how to play t- tiny towns. I can still te- I could teach you tiny towns now. 
because I remember from just that one play experience, um, mm. mainly because the rules are simple, but it's 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 in my head those rules because I love them. The the, the mechanisms themselves are so nice. Mm. <sighs> I have so much going on in my life uh, with with the complexity of my business that um, I just. I'm having a hard time remembering rules from games that that I know. Even it's like it's like sometimes there's just uh, no recall, and then as soon as I start playing it again, I go, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." It all comes back to me. But like at first glance, I'll look at a game and go, "I don't think I could teach that," and yet I know I love that game. Mm-hmm. Kabuki says, "That's my life too. It seems like I'm always learning games, but nobody picks it to play on the game night." until weeks later and then I'm rusty on the rules by then uh, Ben says uh, I still haven't punched Gloomhaven though the fear I won't be able to get back into back it won't be able to get it back into the box <gasps> yeah yeah you have to get one of those Daedalus inserts so that happened a bit with Joan of Arc it was like uh, the, the tokens are all in punches and once you've punched them out there's nowhere for them to go the cards are all wrapped up in cellophane and once you take the cellophane off where do they go and so it's like oh, where's those spare baggies <laughs> and then it's like I find that with those plastic right place those those form plastic uh, where all the little miniatures fit in there yep. and they all kind of got to orientate a certain way yeah um, I find sometimes that can be really confusing. That can be confusing as well. You open the box, you take the minis out, and then you go, wait a minute, where does this one go? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, they're not I, labeled. No, they're not labeled. Uh, the good thing that Batman does is they're labeled, so they're quite easy to find and put back. Oh, so, I mean, you could cool. get Batman and just do a Tom Vassal Dice Tower component drop, and you'll be able to put it back in the box no problem because it's all kind of light labeled up. But, um, yeah, I had a problem putting Joan of Arc away the other day. Uh, one of the characters wouldn't go back in, and it, I figured out why. It's because the, the <laughs> you know that it's concave. Of course, it it's is. It's concaved at the back, and for some reason, the concave had been pushed forward. So when I put the figure in, I go, "No, it doesn't go there because that's not the right shape." And it's like, "Well, it doesn't go anywhere else." <laughs> it took me a while to figure out that I just got to push it back down, and then it went in. Oh. Hey, Chris Goodlett's in the house. In the castle. castle. He's, gonna he's, get he's talking about game trays. What's he saying then? Well, he said it's nice when the inserts actually work. I've noticed some games that game trays, that's Noah Adelman makes, and it makes such a difference. I totally agree. Custom inserts too. I love them. Uh, oh, Nate, that's very British of you, Berkey. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Orientate. Yes. So, so I sent you a picture of my shelf of shame. Here it is. Here's the shelf. The, of shame. There's a whole there's a whole wing of the castle dedicated to all the crap I haven't got to. Look at this. But the problem is it's not crap. Yeah, Look at that. You got Flam Rouge there. Yeah, Flam Rouge is up there. But I played that with you and Forum Trajam. Yeah. But look at I got Lisboa. Full blown Lisboa. Kickstarter. You got Ganymede as well. Am- yeah, Am- that's Museum. supposed to be great. They're good games. Look at them all. Detective. Yeah, to de- detective. El Dorado, uh, Tricarian. Oh my God, you've got uh, my shelf of shame is not that bad. My shelf of shame. It's is, horrible. My shelf of shame is just here. I mean, I want to move it out of the room so I don't have to walk by it. <laughs> so my shelf of shame consists of Dead of Winter, uh, Joan of Arc. Ooh. Um. This game's actually Shrink, the Snitch, Snitch from uh, Jumping Turtle Games. I have unboxed and looked at the rules for Fog of, Law, Fog Fog of Love, of love. Um, but I still haven't played it. And as you can see, the expansion's still in Shrink. And another game that I desperately want to get play to is oh, oh, this Kickstarter from a while ago called Vampire Hunters. Um, mm. But it, it, it's those bigger, hard, it's those bigger, more condensed games, as you can see. Joan of Arc, Vampire Hunters, Dead of Winter. Which are the ones that are hard to eat at the table? Well, my problem is I'm, I'm getting a bunch... Not only am I going to a convention, I'm getting some, you know, uh, Kickstarters that are coming through. I just... just uh, recently, Dragon Boats just came in from Maple Games. Oh, yeah. And 
and then I just received my uh, uh, Nemo's War. Oh, I- and the the Secret Cabal Gaming podcast, Jamie Steg or Jamie Keggy loves Nemo's War. It's a solo game. Yeah, I don't hardly ever play solo games, but. After listening to him talk about this and then seeing some things on it, I thought, man, this looks fantastic. Um, I'm kind of excited to unbox that one just just to take a day off and go play a game by myself. I want to, uh, Ben, uh, you say that you punched Bosk this morning. Did he punch you back? <laughs> just <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Dum, dum. Uh Chris Godlet. There's uh, 15 games on his shelf of shame at the moment. That's not too bad. Yeah, so what do you do with the shelf of shame? Do you, do you, do you call your shelf of shame before you've played a game? Do you, sorry? Or do you keep it there till you play it? Or do you lose interest in it and say, I'm going to get that off of there because I'm not going to get to it? I have, no, I never lose interest. I mean, they're sat on the shelf. Oh, actually, there's another one I've just seen. Uh, good critters I haven't played yet. Again, that requires a big group of people. Hopefully when the gaming um, group starts up again in September, I'll be able to get that to the table because that's quite a simple game to play. But, uh, yeah. So do, you, so do you always play a game before you get rid of it? Oh, yes. Yes. It's got to be played. I've got to know what I it wish, is. I wish I could say that. That hasn't always been the case for me. Mm. It feels bad. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's games that, again, I've played, but I feel that I need to play them again to justify getting rid of them. Um, like I was just saying earlier in the chat, that Thunderstone is a game that I'm, I'm thinking about getting rid of. It's, it's, it's a great deck builder. It just doesn't go down well here. Um, it, we played a five-player game, and it just went on and on and on. And it's like, oh. It was fun unboxing it and fun sorting out and fun sleeving it. And then fun unsleeving it. <laughs> but um, I have six boxes of Thunderstone and Thunderstone Advance all sleeved. I mean, the whole thing probably weighs 70, 80 pounds. I don't know. But yeah. I got Thunderstone Quest, and I like that a lot. All right. So it looks like the other ones will be sliding out. Yes. Correct. Correct. Oh, we, we didn't do the poll. Oh, your poll. You're right. Talk about the poll. Oh. Well, let's wrap this up and then we go to the poll. <clears throat> maybe, maybe on the new poll we can we can ask how many people, how many games are on their shelf of shame. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh, how many people unbox their game right away? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we can get some percentages. Yeah. And find find out other people's behaviors. Yeah. About games. As if we don't know enough yeah. about them already, <laughs> because they are us. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to think of the quote from the film. I can't think of the quote from the film. They're us. They're turning into us, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think that's basically our babble topic. So tell us about the poll. Yeah, after our last show, when we had uh, Keith from Thunderworks Games tell us about his wonderful role playing, and we'd just been well. We'd been all working and doing cons and bits and stuff. And so I put a poll up uh, asking everyone, um, have you worked a convention or worked demoed for a company? And we have uh, 43 people saying no, they've never worked at a convention or an event. And 25 people saying yes, they have, which is interesting. And so the next question that I posted was, if you worked at a convention, why did you do it? And the biggest vote, as you can see, is 50%. 15 people said, uh, simply for the love of gaming and making people happy. And you see this little green tick here? Mm-hmm. That's why. <laughs> I like it that nobody voted for it because I want free games afterwards. Or well, nobody voted for because I had a chance to talk about a great game. Well, that's a bit of a disappointment, really. Because I like talking about a great game. And I'm looking forward to Essen when I'm going to be talking about a great game called Abyss Conspiracy. Um, and nobody, oh, voted, yeah. nobody voted for because I wanted to encounter new people. But I think that 
the love of gaming and making people happy encompasses most of that. Uh, seven people said that they do it because they wanted to get the experience, which is great. And hopefully they'll be back. I should have put, did you enjoy your experience or did you not enjoy your experience? Uh, four people said, because I am an employee of the company. Who are you? Ah, Who are you looking you at go. my, looking at my, my poll and voting? <laughs> we we want free games, don't we, Berkey? To put more on our shelf of shame. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, we also, I turned them down. <laughs> we also had four people say they do conventions because they want a free entry. Is which is honest. <laughs> so yeah, that was our last poll from our last show. I'll put up another poll as as Berkey says about um, our shelf of shame and unboxing. Do you, do you have a shelf of shame? Is it unboxed, or is it still in when it's plastic thingy, even? Yeah, and how many how many games people have on their shelf? Yeah, that'll be interesting. Oh, well, that's been been we've covered a lot of stuff. It's been a while, but we haven't you know we've had guests on the show, so we haven't covered as many of the games. But this show, we covered a lot we of different been, games. Yeah, it feels nice. Um, and again, that, that's that's good as well because that spawned a lot of um, a lot of threads and hits as well due to the fact that we will have a lot of lists of games everywhere. So, Yay! well, I think now that now that Game Toppers their ki- our Kickstarter uh, completed, it was super successful. We had such a great time with so many backers, and now that the convention season is winding down a little bit, you know, we still have. PAX Unplugged and Essen and BGG Con, but they're later in the fall. So we've got a little bit of time here that we're going to be able to continue to work on fulfillment for our backers and getting orders placed and managing the Kickstarter. But one thing I did want to mention real quickly with Game Toppers uh, 2.0, you can actually still get in. If you miss the Kickstarter, have no fear. You can jump right in and you can get all of the same game topper goodness that people experience during the Kickstarter campaign. There's some crazy awesome Kickstarter package prices where you can get the Scotland Yard bundle. This is our number one selling Watson with a storage bag, two mats, collapsible cup holders, all kinds of gizmos that we unlocked over 40 stretch goals uh, during our campaign. You can take advantage of all these things and the Baker Street package, which is with our no, our top selling homes uh, topper, the Reichenbach Falls package that has our big Mycroft, which is now a, a two tables in one, where you get a 48 inch by 48 inch Moriarty and a 48 inch by 96 inch Mycroft topper, all in one package. Some amazing deals, our storage bags and for our gaming mats, where they're hugely successful, people are coming into the late pledge now and buying tons of these storage bags to store all of their game mats. And we have unlocked over 16 thematic game mats. The new Ryan Lockett mat, I mean, it's it's off the hook. It's beautiful, enchanted. The scythe-inspired mat uh, is by the artist Yaroslav, who did Reavers of Midgard, and he did our Viking mat. When you see these mats in person, we had these at Gen Con. Everybody said, well, they look good online, but when they see it in person, they just cannot believe how crazy awesome they are. Uh, We also have a fantasy mat that's coming in different a lot of different sizes and just amazing stuff on the kickstarter so you can still get in on all of this gamer goodness until august 25th after that stuff's still going to be available however we're going to take away a few of the stretch goals because we have to place some orders and excuse me some of the pricing is going to be adjusted slightly still going to be some really great deals but if you want everything that happened in the Kickstarter, you have till August 25th, late pledge now, upgrade every game that you play with a Game Topper. Thank you, Game Toppers. And there you have it. Mm. <laughs> ah, Kabuki Kid says that Ryan Lockett should do a space mat because his space art is better than his fantasy. That's very interesting. Uh, we're going to be doing some very interesting things in the future 
with some very uh, famous board game artists mm-hmm. and uh, Game Toppers is only going to get better. We're we're positioning ourselves to be here to stay. Cool stuff. So, let's wrap it up, shall we? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm. And where can they find us there, Sir Barry? Your screen doesn't come up? Yeah, it does. I'm just clicking the wrong buttons at the same time. You can find us. Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble pretty much anywhere if you type that in Google. It, you'll find us for some strange reason. But <laughs> anyway, you can find us on boardgameseverybodyshould.com, which is my website with all my reviews, and plus my team, my team of French reviewers who are reviewing for me in French and in English, uh, as well as all my um, board game music and Sirenscape music. You can find all that there. You can also go to boardgametheatre.com, and that's his his site down there Woo-hoo. where you can find board game theatre videos as well as the link to the game toppers as well as obviously <laughs> Berkey and Badger yeah and you can find us on Twitter Facebook Berkey and Badger we're pretty much type in Berkey and Badger board game babble and you will find us all over the place including the BGG Guild 2248 and uh, we would love to have your interaction in our poll on the guild and that's BGG Guild 2248. And uh, we'd love to interact with you, so we sure appreciate it. And the professional audio version of this podcast that Barry professionally edits, which is uh, it's fantastic, actually. He really does a good job. I like this video. Uh, that's going to be on iTunes and on Stitcher Radio. So with that all, just thank you all so much for listening and coming into the show. Uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you again in a couple weeks. Thank you again for listening to Berkey and Badger's Board Game Babble. This show was written, produced, and performed by Kevin Burkhardt Smyre and Barry Dublin. As was the music, too, with a little help from the balance of power. Although the good, the bad, and the ugly theme was composed by Ennio Marconi, and background effects were supplied by Sirenscape. Enhance your gaming at sirenscape.com. Join us next time where we might have a special guest or we may review a game. But either way, there'll be more craziness and more babbling.